Hey this is Sayyam Botani and you're listening to Chai Time Data Science a podcast for data science enthusiasts where i interview practitioners researchers and calculators about their journey experience and talk all things about data science Welcome to Chai Time Data Science Show, the show bringing you quarantine content, containing interviews with my machine learning heroes. I am Sayyam Bhutani. If you haven't yet checked out the other podcast that I've recently launched, Chai Time Data Science News, CTDS dot News, please go ahead check it out if you're interested in finding a short data science news podcast. This episode is all about open source and machine learning. In this episode, I interview. one of the core developers at scikit learn and at the time of recording an associate research scientist at data science institute at columbia university andreas muller this episode is slightly different compared to all ctds dot show episodes we talk about how andreas is overview about open source and machine learning and scikit learn itself has evolved over the years how his approach to creating open source apis his understanding of open source has evolved over the years that he's been active in the open source community there's a lot of discussion around scikit learn and i thank you all for all of the questions from the ama all of which have been discussed we also discuss learning through materials and andreas's take on the recent developments in deep learning andreas has also been teaching a course of machine learning at columbia and we also talk about his uh, his previous work there and his uh, advice for learners this is a new format of episodes on ctds dot show so please do let me know if you enjoyed it and for now here's my conversation with andreas muller please enjoy the show Hi everyone! It's really a big honor for me to be talking to one of the core devs from the Scikit Learn community, Andreas Muller. Andreas, thank you so much for saying yes to my request. Uh, thanks for having me. Really excited to be talking to you. So I want to jump right into a few questions. Uh, these will sort of skip over a few details because you've already been sharing uh, most of them through a lot of interviews that I found while uh, doing my research. So I'll have those linked in the description instead. Uh, my first question would be: You got involved in Scikit Learn uh, during the early days. How has your contribution uh, changed and evolved over the years? Uh, that's a good question. So, I mean, I'm not sure if it's even fair to say I started uh, in the early days. In early days for adoption, but probably not in development because most of the algorithms were already there. Um, so it was really already a fully fledged package when I started, and um, but so. I think what has most changed is that while well, at the very beginning I added some like small algorithms, but I was mostly always on like the more maintaining and bigger picture kind of stuff. And um, I think what changed is that right now I'm not as um, involved with the development most of the time. I'm uh, I was more involved um, involved with like finding funding and. Um, Writing the government document, uh, working on the roadmap, uh, finding people to work on a project, and so it's like I do more of the like organizational stuff and less of the development. I guess that's like a typical thing in an, any organization. Like uh, the more experienced you become, the more you go from like the hands-on work to the more like project management work. You were able to get your ideas translated into uh, real code through managing multiple people. Do you miss the development days? Oh yeah, it's like uh, development is is great, and I, I mean, I always try to get back to it as much as possible. Um, it's like I, I saw a tweet from someone recently. I don't know, maybe it was Hillary Mason or something like uh, that was saying that. Oh my God, I uh, how much I miss development, and I was like, <laughs> yes, 
everybody that uh, does a lot of other stuff like we really we, we started for the coding because that's the thing that we enjoy and so one of the things i did is i started this project called dabble like a year ago or something or maybe it's even two years now um and so because that's like very early stages that's i can actually, i actually do like a lot of the coding there which is very different from scikit learn where scikit learn moves very slowly and um like it's much harder to contribute. So basically I create myself a little bit of an outlet to uh, like do more of the very quick uh, development, uh, which is a lot of fun, I think. Okay, can, can you tell us more about Dabble? I think it's it, it's true to the word it allows you to dabble with projects. Can you share a bit more about that? Yeah, uh, sure. So it's like still very early stages, um, but the idea is basically to make a more accessible data science machine learning library that allows you to um, get prototypes very, very quickly. So I guess it borrowed some ideas from things like uh, pandas profiling, for example, where mm. um, and, and some like things in the visualization community, we are trying to find good visualizations automatically. So first the idea is to get a good idea of your data set and then automatically run some simple uh, automatic machine learning uh, things. So a lot of scikit-learn allows you to build very complex pipelines yeah. and like basically do whatever you want. Scikit-learn gives you a lot of freedom, but for a lot of practical problems, you actually don't need a lot of freedom. And basically if you run like uh, some uh, gradient boosting, it's probably going to work out okay. And um, so that will include a quick way to tune things like gradient boosting and SVMs and uh, random forests by a successive halving. And there's like basically a built-in list of classifier tries and of regressors it tries. And um, but then it focuses more on doing the pre-processing for you automatically, trying to detect types, um, yeah, doing some visualization, and then hopefully soon also doing some more um, uh, model explanation, like showing you the relevant metrics and visualiz visualizing them and uh, showing you like partial dependence curves, permutation importance, um, these kind of like uh, debugging uh, tools that you want. It, it's it's uh, sort of a tribute to the running tweet joke that in, in industry, they really just use logistic regression, which is just good enough. So is, is it uh, aimed for the industry so that people can iterate real quickly, come up with prototypes? I mean, yeah, it's, it's definitely, I mean, I'm not sure if it's just for industry, like the same as student science, but it's uh, used to iterate very quickly because I think basically uh, like everybody has their favorite version of like the machine learning workflow diagram where you like start with collecting the data or defining the problem and so on and you iterate building models and you put it into production. And I think um, really having this be a cycle is very important. And so I want to create tools that allow you to make the cycle much faster so you can try out something and then maybe go back and collect new data. So we have very good tools for like the model tweaking and uh, tuning and that's what scikit-learn is great at. But then people, I think, spend too much time in trying to build the perfect pipeline for the data set instead of like maybe thinking about what is the problem I'm trying to solve? What are the metrics I should be looking at? Can I collect new data? Um, and so all these like, all these other steps of this uh, workflow cycle, they get too little attention. And so basically I wanted to say, well, this actually the model building part is the easy part. And so you can try to automate this away as much as possible. And yeah, yeah. so basically if you do, if you try logistic regression and gradient boosting, it's probably gonna be fine, but really you should t think about what does your data mean? Hmm. Um, it, so as uh, if, if I understand correctly, it addresses uh, the iteration pipeline for software 2.2, so to speak. Yeah, a little bit. So um, one of the things that it skips is uh, productionization. So it does definitely doesn't aim, like it's definitely not production ready right now, but it also doesn't aim to have this part of the cycle. So it's the like data scientist exploratory analysis um, cycle and um, not like, like there, there's the bigger cycle of obviously of going to production, doing continuous deployment, doing uh, monitoring, dashboarding, and so on, which are also all very important parts. Um, but they're not what I'm what I'm targeting. I'm basically targeting the things that are already there in the Python ecosystem. So the Python ecosystem is not that much used, I guess, in the in uh, these more productionizing issues, or the SciPy ecosystem at least is not. And so I'm trying to like. Um, collect a little bit more of the things that where the uh, Python ecosystem is already strong, like exploratory mm -hmm. data analysis, machine learning, and trying to put them together to like a simple to use coherent piece. 
which will allow to bridge the gap between uh, the data scientists and the production team which for many big industries tend to become different yeah i mean it's definitely still going to be uh, a gap to be solved but uh, yeah hopefully okay. that the people will then f- uh, focus less on on the endless tweaking of the model and more on the overall process uh, you've also given a talk on this topic of auto ml what, what are your thoughts on it in 2020 I, i'm biased towards auto ml uh, would love to hear your thoughts too um it depends so there's actually there's quite like different flavors of auto ml and um so i'm maybe obviously more on this what's now called classical ml side so the stuff that's like it learn the strong and less the deep learning side and so there's really a lot of interest in auto ml and deep learning and um like if we can neural architecture search and this seems like quite an interesting topic but it's definitely not my expertise and i ca- i can't really say much about like what's happening uh, there mm-hmm. but in terms of the more classical stuff um i'm i'm a big fan and a friend of the group at um, at freiburg from frank hatter and matthias feuer i'm not sure if you know these guys they did uh, smack and auto sk learn and uh, they won a, bu- a bunch of auto ml competitions and uh, yeah i really love their work um and so in one of their works they found basically if they create a portfolio of good algorithms to test i i, I love this portfolio approach it's what i implement in dabble basically they found uh, if you just use xgboost it's as good as trying to learn uh, trying to tune over all pipelines in scikit learn um that is kind of shocking to me but mm. also not that shocking this is definitely this comes with a bunch of caveats in that like they only tried a couple of the pipelines and they only gave it so much uh, computing power and they only used this handful of data sets so um, i wouldn't make this claim that this is true in general but you can solve a wide variety of problems with a very limited number of uh, of machine learning pipelines hmm. and so in a sense this is um, a win for auto ml but it also means you don't actually need that much auto ml if there's only a small number of good candidates then selecting among these candidates is pretty easy and so um that's why i like this um this portfolio approach where basically you, you figure out a um list of good candidates and um then you do some efficient search over these candidates and so even if you just do something like hyperbranch or successive halving it's already quite quite effective um and i mean th- then there there's like there's very interesting more fancy stuff there's a great matrix factorization approach and then there's a bunch of approaches that try to incorporate um runtime of the algorithms more that's something yeah. that's not fully explored yet i think it's very important to um look into the runtime of the algorithms but i don't think anyone has sort of found a real solution there but so i guess my my main thought is like in classical ml it seems like you can get away with relatively simple solutions um for like a majority of cases um and so auto ml is good but it's also going to be easy i should also caveat this by saying this is for getting like i don't know 95% there you can hmm. probably spend much more compute do something much more advanced do something much more fancy and spend a lot lot more work and get like the extra percent but um one of the things that i I'm doing with Dabble and I think is true for many practitioners is it doesn't really matter how much like to the last percent might not matter as much as um moving on to the next product like uh the question is how much impact can you have if you spend more time on this project versus another project and very often um building a very very complex solution and spending more time is not um as beneficial as building a good enough solution that's robust and then go to the next thing yeah i think uh, auto ml would also in in sorts allow this so that you don't have to just focus on let's say picking between models you can aut- leave that part to automation and focus on other stuff that sort of require domain expertise yeah sure i mean i guess the the question for me is sort of the trade off the trade off of do you really want to run a really like big expensive search over everything like how much is the benefit i mean if it's if it's free to do so i guess there is no downside to doing it like if you have infinite compute then you can run the biggest model of search but if you do that and uh, the outcome is that it's basically as good as what you had to start with then um yeah yeah i'm not sure 
I'm, I'm not sure exactly what a trade-off is and how much work you should actually actually put into uh, tuning something as good as possible. Understood. Now I want to come back to uh, open source and API designs. I think scikit-learn was slightly or actually much ahead of its time in terms of design because it was ahead of the curve for the machine learning hype. Uh, what are your thoughts on creating good API designs, uh, especially for open source or otherwise? Um, Sure. So, I mean, I can't take any credit for most of the scikit-learn API, but I think it's some, by being involved in a project is something that I very much uh, came to appreciate. And whenever we are trying to uh, create uh, just a new class or a new kind of functionality, we were always really looking for um, creating easy to use APIs. And um, yeah, I can, I can, Give, give some ideas about what my strategy there is. So one of them is um, really use case driven. So um, think about what do the users want to do with the API and how will their code look? So this is a mixture between sort of test driven and development driven develop, uh, development. So I really mm -hmm. like like this idea of develop uh, documentation driven development. So there's um, two things that I think about in the API. One is how easy is it to teach? And then the other one is how easy is it to use once you understand it? And so um, if you have something that is like super elegant code, but it's impossible to understand for a newcomer, it's probably gonna be hard to sell this. So you want something that is a good compromise between being uh, like succinct and expressive and easy to teach and understand. So in the beginning, no one will have a mental model of how your code works. If it's easy yeah. for people to build a mental model of how your code works, they will be less surprised by what it does. So having your interface be easy to explain is really important. But then obviously you also want it to be easy to use. Um, maybe one of the things that, um, at least now in scikit-learn, is something that's very much at the forefront is usually the, all of the discussions are about API and not about the implementation. Like scikit-learn implements some like somewhat gnarly like numeric optimization stuff, right? But the implementation is basically always the easy part. Yeah. Um, the hard part is how to make the interface because the implementation you can very easily change later on. The interface is very hard to change in an open source package. So often, um, yeah, we spend much more time on the interface than on the implementation. And so uh, what should, also what should the behavior be? Like let's say the user specifies this parameter, of com this combination of parameters, what is the expected outcome? Does the expected outcome make sense? Um, and like, how do we document this? Again, this is the explainability. Like if we add a new functionality to, some, to an uh, existing object, we probably need to add a new parameter or a new option. How can we make this option discoverable? And how can we make sure that it plays nice with all the other options? Um, and there's like, and, and it's like things are really silly sometimes, or you think they're silly. There's been a, um, a very obvious thing is in the one hot encoder, you often might want to limit the number of uh, um, uh, categories to like some maximum. Let's say uh, you have 100,000 categories, but you only want to one hot encode the 50 most common ones. Like you assume there's a long tail and you put everything else in the other category. And that's like a very obvious thing to do. And it's something that Cyclone should have, but has, does not have right now. Uh, hopefully it has it in the next release. But the reason is that the one hot encoder already has so many options that it's very mm. hard to make sure that like all the different combinations the user can specify make sense. So what happens to unknown categories? What happens if the user said, well, I want to drop one of the categories? There, there's like lots of weird edge cases that you wouldn't think about. Um, like how does this like combine with having missing values? And so, Things that seem simple can be quite gnarly in, in the implementation details. The challenge really becomes how do you come up with how would people intuitively approach this? How would you assume others' intuition about the API of sorts? Oh yeah, but that's write the documentation, right? So hmm. I mean we we rarely write out the full documentation, but we are all, I guess, 
we, we know how we would write a document. We've written enough documentation that we can think about it. If you haven't written that much documentation, just write the documentation, it's not that much work. And like, uh, then maybe have one other person read the documentation at least. So, I mean, code reviews are obviously super, super important for API design. So I just, so the model in scikit-learn is that um, HPR needs to be reviewed by at least two other core developers. Okay. And so, um, like if your code is not reviewed, then probably your code is bad and your API is bad. Sometimes you don't really have a choice uh, if you don't have anyone to review, but like you should review the code and you have people like uh, as like one, ideally two people uh, look at your code. And so if you write documentation and someone else can read it and understand it, then, uh, then you know sort of what kind of mental image it will form maybe. I mean, okay. you can't know perfectly, but if you have a hard time writing understandable documentation, it's probably a problem. That again uh, hints back to your documentation driven development, as you had said. Now, yeah. uh, coming coming to the evolution of the framework, Scikit uh, sort of evolves slowly compared to other frameworks, at least if I may say so. And uh, the shift in the community, how, how has your opinion changed in the shift from classical algorithms towards now deep neural nets like really make uh, transformer models that have been coming out? Yeah, so first of all, just a, uh, a slight pet peeve of mine. It's like, it's kind of funny that people say this is classical ML and deep learning is a new thing. You know, it's like historically it's the other way around, right? Neural networks are uh, much older than like random <laughs> forest and gradient boosting. Correct. Um, but anyway, so in the I guess in the modern form they're they're different. But so, second learn is slow for two reasons. One reason is well, let's say three reasons. First reason is we don't have enough resources to review all the code we would like to review mostly. It's easy to get resources more easy to get um, resources to write code, but it's harder to get resources to review all the code that we want to review. Um, the second is we want to be careful. A lot of people rely on this, so we don't want to make any like um, quick, drastic changes. Uh, we, and that's a reason to be conservative, right? We, we're intentionally conservative. And the third is that, um, like, it, compared to the deep, what's happening in the deep learning community, there's not that much super exciting stuff happening in like the classical algorithms. So obviously, there's like. Uh, probably by now there's like thousands of papers every NeurIPS and ICML. Yeah. But uh, the question is how much impact will these have for practitioners? And so it's, um, yeah, m it's often tweaks to existing algorithms and um, like it's quite rare that it's, there's like a new thing that's going to be a big improvement that's going to clearly deliver to practitioners. Um, There's stuff that happens to like the grain boosting implementations, making them a bit faster and a bit nicer. That's cool. There are some stuff in like AutoML and success of halving, and uh, that's kind of cool. But there's not like there's not big splashes. There's uh, yeah, for example, the the, the whole uh, transformer thing and uh, is like still relatively new and mm -hmm. um, clearly made a big impact. Like, um, but but like I don't know what the last thing is that made a big impact in like classical ML. Um, it might be hyperband, um, which, which is, I don't know, how old is that now? Five years? I think so. <laughs> Something like that. Yeah, so, um, I mean, there's there's a couple of things happening in like the interpretable uh, ML space, but also there. So I guess like CHAP is newer than that and people are quite quite interested in CHAP. Um, but so also the, the sort of scikit-learn wants to um, just add, okay, maybe there's one more reason I should mention is scikit-learn wants to add things that's kind of stood the test of time because otherwise hmm. you end up with a lot of code that's not maintainable. If you add everything that beats the benchmark, you will end up with hundreds of algorithms, most of which are uh, out of date. Yeah. So uh, I actually had a conversation the other day with um, someone working on Shogun. Um, Shogun is also a machine learning library for C++. It um, started mostly focusing on kernel uh, machines. It's, um, it's a pretty great library. It didn't get as much adoption as I could learn. They might start, have started a little bit earlier or about the same time. And so they had a slightly different policy. They added a lot of state-of-the-art algorithms, so algorithms that were just published. 
And so that's nice because you can reproduce results in current papers. So they had a lot of cool stuff about like multiple kernel learning. And I, I used that in my thesis. Um, but um, the problem is now the person that contributed this algorithm has long graduated or went to industry or something. No one yeah. understands the code and no one's really interested in the code because there's something new and shiny out there. Mm. And so you end up with a lot of code that's very hard to maintain. And it's maybe not even worth maintaining. And so Cyclone basically set, decided we're not going to do this. At some point we wrote something in the FAQ that says, um, we only accept new algorithms if they're three years old and have uh, 200 citations plus. Um, and so this is look, somewhat arbitrary, but it got us a lot less emails that say, hey, can you implement our fancy new algorithm? Because the answer is just no, here's the criteria, it's very clear. There's also, I also unfortunately spend a lot of time on Twitter, the ML Twitter community is great. Uh, Denny Brits had shared this tweet, I think, if if the authors can share the git log of their new paper and their new SOTA, it just becomes one line of sorts for, for some of the uh, recent SOTA architectures at least. Uh, sorry, can, can you say it again? By, by so I mean state of the art. So Denny yeah, yeah. had uh, shared this tweet that if some authors can share, uh, can just uh, summarize their paper with a git log of the difference, it just yeah. becomes one line of difference for a state of the art new model. Yeah, and that, that yeah, I mean, often it's the, 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 the small tweaks, right? Um, I mean, even, even things that make a big splash like uh, a dropout is not that many lines of code, right? Yeah. It's just, it's, a, it's very hard to say which line is the right one. <laughs> Certainly. Now, uh, coming to your mission, uh, your mission on your personal website is to create open tools, uh, open source tools to lower the barrier of entry for ML apps. Uh, how, uh, how much of that goal would you say you have achieved? How far are you from, let's say, just checking, uh, checking that box off of your to-do list? I mean, it says make it more accessible, right? And so you, you, you can always make it more accessible, I think. Um, so, I mean, there's been a lot of progress that I cannot take any credit for, right? There's like, so it's like a huge community that has a lot of amazing work going on. Um, so if, if ever this box gets checked, it's definitely not due to my work. Um, so, but th there's things that I don't like and basically, I, I wouldn't say we're close to what I want. One of the things that is a pet peeve of mine is that in scikit-learn, it's very hard to deal with feature names. So if you build a complex pipeline, it's very hard to understand what's going on. And um, I hope we're gonna solve this this year. Uh, I probably said that last year already. Okay. Uh, maybe even the year before. Um, and I also think there's, um, and, and there, there's like a couple of stupid things in scikit-learn like that, where that should just be fixed. Um, there's also definitely some friction integrating between scikit-learn and pandas still. Um, and like, there's things in visualization. So I'm doing some visualization in, in Dabble and um, that's, uh, based on matplotlib. And I think it's it's helpful because like, there's not really that many machine learning focused visualization tools. So if you look at Seaborn, Seaborn does sort of a lot of uh, great statistics plots, but actually it's kind of tricky to do the plots that I want to do with it um, because I'm not really the target audience. Um, yeah. And um, like Seaborn is expanding. Um, a little bit more to like uh, wide form data. And so that might help, but um, I don't think it's really the right, the right venue to, for machine learning uh, visualizations and for like high dimensional data. Um, there's yellow brick, which is uh, doing some visualizations on top of scikit-learn, which is cool. Um, we're also now adding a bunch of um, visualizations to, um, to scikit-learn itself. So there's like, I mean, it's super trivial stuff. Like there's plot rock curve and plot, a plot AOC and plot confusion matrix, which are like very easy, but also again, you need to get the API right and everything. Yeah. And, um, but it's, it's, also, it's also nice if you don't have to write 10 lines of matplotlib code to get a nice plot of a rock curve. Um, 
um, like a bigger picture issue for the ecosystem is sort of what's the right right plotting library. Um, Matplotlib is going through some restructuring. They want to change their data model. Um, but there's also a thing about like, okay, everybody is now on, uh, or many people are doing Jupyter Notebooks. So maybe something that is more directly integrated with the web would be better for interactivity. Interactivity is a little bit sluggish with Matplotlib because of the architecture, I think. I'm not sure if it's fixable, maybe it is fixable. Um, but if you look at the interactivity of like Altera or Plotly or Bokeh, there it's like much quicker. And so then the question is like, well, a lot of these libraries are all built on Matplotlib. Um, do we want to uh, swap out the back end? And mm. if we want to swap out the back end, like which of these ones do we want to pick? Like, is it a good idea to have as a community move to Altair or move to Plotly um, or move to Bokeh? And so I I don't think there's an answer. I'm, I'm definitely not the person that's going to answer this question, but uh, I think it's something where if we don't know how to plot well, then we can't say we are accessible. Yeah, that's a great point. Uh, the next question comes from an anonymous Redditor and Redditors love controversies. The question is uh, the biggest controversy you've seen in the scikit-learn community. Biggest controversy? I don't know. Do you mean, be, would you say between uh, developers or in the community? Um, uh, Let's say uh, between uh, just just sit in, in the community. In the community, oh, there, there's like there was this amazing flame war about a logistic regression recently. So it was kind of started by a tweet by Zach Lipton, um, who, who's a really cool guy, and I really I lo love his work. But basically, he he, he tweeted that um, well, how many papers have wrong results because logistic regression and second learners penalized? And uh, I don't know if you saw that. I and did, did. Uh, yeah, and so that was like. Several developers muted the thread because it got so bad, um, and yeah, so that, that that was fun. So I mean, the main thing is, if you're a statistician, you don't want logistic regression to be uh, penalized, and they said, oh, they, uh, the second learn developers like they didn't know what to do uh, if they got NANs in their correlated features or something like this. Um, obviously, the point is that we don't want to get NANDs if we have correlated features, which is why we regularize. So if you have a perspective, uh, predictive perspective, then re uh, regularizing makes a lot of sense, like from a predictive and from optimization perspective, from a statistical perspective, it makes no sense at all. And so I think this is something that comes up in a couple of places is um, that people that have more statistics um, or, or inference view, they're like very put off by scikit-learn because mm -hmm. this is really not the problem we want to solve. Um, but in Python, there's also no package that is as mature as scikit-learn that solves these problems. So there's um, stats models, and stats models does uh, a bunch of great things, but stats models doesn't have that big a community, that big of a developer base. And so um, if you look for logistic regression, it's very likely you'll find scikit-learn before you find stats models. But if you're a statistician, then this is not what you want. It makes sense. Um... You've been involved in scikit-learn for a while. Uh, when do you think, when do you envision 1.0 of the version uh, of the framework coming out? This is also a controversial question, um, but this is more among the developers. When do I envision? So we always say next year, every year, <laughs> maybe. Um, so the question is a little bit, what is the list What's missing of out from the framework in, in your yeah, opinion? Exactly, this, this, the question is like, do we want to make a list of requirements? Um, actually, I, I wrote a grant to NSF that had, as one of the to-do items, figure out how to do a, a 1.0 release. Unfortunately, they didn't get funded because they said uh, uh, second version development doesn't help computer science research. And so... Uh, what? Any, any, well, the, the NSF has, is, is, uh, has interesting opinions on open source. Um, anyway, so... Um, I, I keep arguing with them, but well, we'll see. Maybe yeah. some, at some point some, something comes of it. Um, wait, so um, 1.0. The question is, do we want to make a list of features and then say, once we have these features, we want to release? Hmm. And if so, what is this list of features? Or should we just not care about the list of features and just release? So for me personally, one of the things that I really care about is this feature names thing. So I feel like if I create a pipeline 
and I have a logistic regression at the end, I should be able to figure out what do the coefficients in the logistic regression mean. If I don't know what the coefficients in the logistic regression mean, that's like, that's a really bad situation. And actually, if you can easily build a cycle learn pipeline where it's really hard to figure out if you have like an imputer and one hot encoder and like column transformer and, um, and a feature selection or whatever, you don't even need to be that, that tricky. If you just have an imputer and a one hot encoder, it can be already tri tricky. And so this is something I'm sort of passionate about, but I'm all, but maybe I, we also don't want to want to block um, for that. There's actually there's an issue on GitHub that is um, what do we need for a 1.0 release? Hmm. Um, but yeah, it's it's a little bit unclear, and probably what it needs is a dedicated push, which is why I wrote this 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 um, grant proposal. But I don't think any one of the developers is currently making this push. So basically, if I say okay, my thing is now I want to do a 1.0 release, and if I spend my energy on rallying the, de the other developers behind that, then we could probably make it happen this year. Um, but or if any of the other core developers does that, right? The question, but the thing is, this is not anyone's like really high priority, and so it's probably not going to happen this year unless someone comes along and makes it as their priority. Understood. Now, uh, this is a question that I see like many OK boomers making a mistake as uh, people skip over escalar because deep learning is cool right now. Just the newcomers, if I may, they just jump onto deep learning, just jump onto transformer models uh, without even uh, knowing what escalar is, unfortunately, for some of them. W what are your views on that? I mean, it depends a little bit on what they want to do, right? So um, I think. there's only a very small subset of machine learning problems that are best solved with a transformer model. And, yeah. uh, but if you want or, to- Or like, deep learning broadly speaking, maybe yeah. like, let's, let's hit this to that. Yeah, so it, like if you, if you want to do like applications, it's probably a bad idea. Mm -hmm. If you want to do, well, I guess if you want to do research, it depends. If you want to do more fundamental research, it's a bad idea. But there's also people who build state-of-the-art deep learning um, like solutions um, without like a strong like computer science background. And so you can do things in the space and you can probably like, uh, maybe if you're lucky, put, uh, push the state of the art forward. But um, if you want to solve problems, it depends on whether it's the right tool for the problem. And so, and again, this goes back a little bit to what I said earlier. Um, Building the model is only a very small part of of the process usually. So, if you want to, if you have a problem, and um, let's say with logistic regression you get ninety percent accuracy, and with a deep neural net you get ninety nine percent accuracy on the data set. But probably, um, if you spend uh, I don't know how many weeks making the deep neural net, or let's say maybe at least days to make the deep neural yeah. network work, um, then probably you're wasting your time because there's an issue in your data set. And uh, you should have probably formulated a problem in a different way. And so uh, by, but figuring this out is also gonna be harder for the deep neural network than it is for a logistic regression model. So I think you're missing out and you're slowing yourself down. If you're um, interested in actually solving problems effectively, if you're interested in winning on Kaggle, maybe this uh, applies mm -hmm. less. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this, maybe maybe you can just uh, take the someone else's deep learning code and then tweak the parameters, or maybe add some idea in there, and it'll work. But this is um, so it depends a lot on what do you want to do, right? Makes um, sense. This also allows me to segue into another interesting aspect of your journey. You moved from industry back into research. Why did you decide to make the transition? And uh, did that allow you to have an interesting perspective on software in industry versus academia? There's so, oh my God, there's so much in this. Um, okay, when, when will this be aired? Uh, around two weeks from now. Okay. So then you all know that I'll be joining Microsoft. Um, 
in uh, the middle of June, meaning I'm going to go back to industry. Okay. And so, um, so that's, so I, I went back and forth. So basically after my PhD, I went to Amazon for a year. Then I went to um, NYU, then Columbia, and now I'm going to Microsoft. And mm -hmm. so I think one of the things that I really appreciated about um, uh, academia was the freedom to work on uh, whatever I wanted to work on. So I, f I feel like my work on psych learning, machine learning has a lot of impact. And I felt like even if my things get productionized at Amazon, I have less impact than if I work on scikit-learn. Um, at least the kind of impact that I personally care about. Um, and so um, that's why I went to academia, because I had the freedom to work on these problems. The reason why I'm uh, leaving academia again is uh, basically it's hard to get funding for the kind of work that I want to do, and it's hard to get credit for it. So I'm on a, a soft money position at Columbia right now, meaning that I have to find money to pay myself and to pay my group, hmm. um, and that's a lot of work. And so either I w would have to keep up doing that work indefinitely, or I would have to become a professor. To become a professor, I would actually need to uh, change what I do quite a bit and do much more research and publishing. And then I could become a professor in maybe six or seven years. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's, um, yeah. So g going to industry back again, um, I guess now, uh, now my situation will be quite different than when I was at Amazon before in that now I'm sort of more senior. And so now people will let me do more what I want to do. And they actually, they hire me because of my open source work and because of my position in the PyData ecosystem, right? They want me to work on these things. Still, uh, I assume that I'll have less freedom than what I'll have in academia. In academia, I can do whatever I want uh, as long as I find money for it. Um, and so there's, there's pros and cons to that, like basically security via freedom and also, um, somewhat the, the kind of access um, to resources. So at Columbia, I think, I mean, I was actually quite lucky. I have two amazing people working with me, uh, uh, Nicola Uck and uh, Thomas uh, Fan. And so I was able to fund them and they're doing amazing work. So they're all doing all the programming. I'm not really doing any of the programming. Uh, Nicholas did the history and gradient boosting. I don't know if you saw that. And Thomas did so much work in the visualization and the scoring and the debugging and the infrastructure. And so, um, yeah, so, but, but actually two people is a lot of resources in academia. Yeah. In industry, it's nothing. If you look at what, uh, what industry teams are, they have like 10, 20 people working on something. And so, I mean, it's, this also makes it diffi more difficult to coordinate with uh, open source teams. So if you have part of a team that's an industry, part of it is open source, um, it's, it's different. There's like a, quite a difference between how the Apache ecosystem works and how the PyData ecosystem works, for example. Yeah. Um, but still, I think we, um, PyData uh, needs to figure out better funding models. And I think one of them is, um, becoming more directly connected to industry. Um. Okay. I, if, if I may say, it's, this is a little ahead of time, but uh, Microsoft is going towards a big push, making a big push towards open source. Uh, will you continue doing open source work there? Can you share a bit of that ahead of time? Oh, yeah, yeah. I've, I will definitely continue doing open source work there. Um, and I mean, there will be a balance between my personal project and coordinating between Microsoft and the PyData ecosystem. So one of the big things in my role will be how can um, Microsoft product and um, product on Azure and SQL product and so on, how can they help the PyData ecosystem and how can they integrate well with the PyData ecosystem? Okay. Um, I want to discuss uh... Uh, area that you were active in until recently uh, teaching at Columbia University. What courses did you teach there? I'm actually midway through your latest 2020 version of the course and would highly recommend it to the audience. But uh, 
any things that you've enjoyed and any mistakes you uh, recognize that students make while uh, doing data science courses or machine learning courses? I think that was a lot of questions. Um, so the course that I, I basically only ever taught this course, I also taught a project capstone course, and I taught the applied machine learning but four times. And so yeah, check it out on YouTube. It's there, the 2019 and 2020 version, it's quite similar. Um, and this is there on your channel, right? The, yeah, yeah. The thing to suggest for your com okay. slash Andreas Muller. And it's on YouTube and it's all free. There's also slides and you can look at the homework. Um, what I'm doing right now, actually, and I don't know how long it's going to take, um, is uh, I'm, I'm trying to make the course into a new book. And so hopefully this will be even more accessible. So you'll have both the videos and the book. So currently the book that I have out with O'Reilly, the Introduction to Machine Learning with Python, um, is very introductory. I think it, I, I like it, but it's a little bit outdated and it's much more introductory than the the class I have on YouTube. And so basically I wanna create something that's a little bit more on the level of um, my class at Columbia, but also still doesn't require a background in linear algebra and statistics. Um, do, you, maybe, do you have a timeline on when that'll come out? When can we expect that? Well, ideally I would have it come out before um, I join Microsoft, but I don't think that's realistic. <laughs> Um, so let, it depends on, um, what, what draft version, like, okay, I really want to do this summer. Okay. And my goal is for, for this to be freely available. So, um, as Jupyter Notebooks and as HTML online. That'll be amazing. Okay. So, but coming back to your other part of your question is like common mistakes. And so this is more um, mistake I saw in the project course, which is, um, well, basically all the things that I said, everybody the main mistake most people make is like not thinking about the bigger workflow, tweaking to model too long, not looking at the data, not doing visualization well. Um, in particular, there were many projects where students were working for weeks on a deep learning solution and I told them, try rich regression, try rich regression, try rich regression. And then after uh, two months, they were like, oh, we tried rich regression and it's better than our LSTM. And I'm like, yes, that's because your LSTM is not working and you have no baseline. Figure out what is the baseline. What, what will be the performance if you do constant prediction? What will be performance if you do like the silliest baseline? I wasn't really saying you should use rich regression to solve this problem. It was like a time series prediction problem. Probably rich regression is not the right solution, but it will give you a baseline that tells you, is my complex model actually working or not? And um, so they jumped to something really complicated that was really hard to make work. And uh, clearly it didn't work because the really simple solution beat it. Um, so that's a very common problem. Um, now, this is uh, an, an issue that I think you've already addressed uh, in I think all of your previous interviews, but the gender bias in open source community and even in the tech community, widely speaking, what are your thoughts and how can we cut down on that? You have already contributed to so many sprints with uh, Women DS, I believe, uh, but what can we uh, other developers from every day uh, contribute that that might be helpful? This is a very serious topic and a very hard, um, hard problem, I think. And there's, um, there's issues at so many levels. So the, th the, the issue that I guess I am focusing on is on the developer level or in the core developer um, level. So we have no female, oh, sorry, we have one female core developer. Um, now the core, it's like alone right now, I think. But that's like that one out of 20 or 21, that's bad. Mm -hmm. um, and much of those HiPy ecosystem uh, projects are about as bad. And so one of the things that I'm trying to do with the sprint is engage more people as developers. Um, yeah, I, I don't think I'm doing as good a job with that as I should. Um, but so probably one of the parts of the answer is um, mentoring and engaging with people. It's really, you get the best outcomes if you long-term engage with people on like a one-on-one -on -one, um, basis and p build like personal relationships. And um, but there's also obviously other parts of sort of the pipeline that are broken. Like if you look at uh, CS degrees, um, it's actually quite interesting. If, 
the two programs I was involved in, you could see that um, in the, like there's a very uh, large foreign student population. Uh, of course, it's like maybe 50 or 60% of the students in the data science at Columbia and at um, NYU were Chinese. And in, uh, from the Chinese students, actually the gender ratio is pretty balanced. Then um, you can look at the next quick popul big population is Indian students. There's maybe like 30%. Um, it's uh, less balanced. Maybe there's like 20% women or something um, or 30% women. And then if you look at the US students and all the rest of the world, it's really terrible. Hmm. And it's like, I don't know, 10% or less. Um, that, that's, I thought that was quite interesting uh, in that, that there's such a big discrepancy between the different countries. So it seems to be um, at least, okay, obviously this is not a perfect measure, but it seems to be uh, more of an issue in the US and Europe than it is uh, in China or than it is even in India, um, which is interesting. But so there's like, yeah, on the CS students, data science students side, on the developers in open source, um, yeah. So I think um, oh, for the overall culture, I think um, maybe what might be important is like culture shift. So I'm not that involved with a lot of like the coding tech community, but I think there's still a lot of the like bro culture that you see in Silicon Valley that will definitely disincentivize uh, mm. like women from from joining uh, these companies. And so um, no matter what environment you're in, make sure that your environment, environment is inviting. Maybe ask people why they don't join the, the community or your company or uh, why they leave, what the problems are. It's often not um, obvious. So I've seen this at Cycle Learn that the, the values are different partially and the way people are communicate are different. And people that do advocacy and diversity tell me this. Um, there's, um, so you might do things to turn away people that you're not aware of because they interpret something that you do in a different way. And you need to make yourself aware of and you need to change your behavior that's driving people away. Um, there was a really great talk recently um, when I was at, uh, oh my God, I forgot what it's called. Was it the Mursla on Data Science Summit? I think it was called that still. Maybe it changed its name. But, uh, oh, no, no, no. It was the Chan Zuckerberg. Yes, sorry. I go to too many data science summits. Um, <laughs> it was uh, Chan Zuckerberg had, has this amazing essential open source uh, software program where they fund uh, open source projects, um, both that are like core science and those that are like uh, biomedical. And there was a really great talk about diversity and I, I'll send you the link and you can in include it maybe in the description or something. Definitely. Now, uh, you've already given us so much, uh, broadly speaking, if I may dis say, speak on the data science uh, community's uh, point of view, but what's your favorite uh, activity outside of tech? Uh, what do you enjoy outside of tech? Um, so th this is probably hilarious, but right now I'm really baking a lot of bread, like a lot of people in the US. Um, <laughs> yeah. Let's so say on non-pandemic non days, uh, what do you I the actually, I actually bake bread on non-pandemic, I used to bake bread on non-pandemic days, but oh, it's okay. very hard with your working days, so now I really got back into it. Um, That's other than that, um, reading and uh, photography, I guess. Uh, <laughs> Sometimes I'm gaming a little bit, but not that much. Mostly I'm just reading some sci-fi novels and, and like uh, take pictures of my friends and stuff like that. Um, okay. This, this might be a really tough question. What's your favorite game of all time? What's my favorite game of all time? <sighs> <laughs> I mean, so I used to play StarCraft 1 competitively. In StarCraft like a 1? League. StarCraft 1. Okay. And so... This is definitely one of the contenders. Um, Let, let's pick two, one of all time, and maybe if you were to pick one today, the only game that you're allowed to play. The only game. So, oh, 
And I really love world builder. Uh, like no, sorry, Gene world building. So okay, no, I can't. I can't pick one. So I'll have to. You now have to listen to me rant about the games I'm playing, and you ask for this yourself. And so I'm. I for a time I was super obsessed with city skylines, which is like Sim Cities plus plus. But yeah. you also have to manage the traffic and the traffic lights and all of this stuff. It's super intricate and it's amazing. Um, then I've played Factorio recently and Satisfactory, which are both uh, factory building games. Like mm -hmm. research management, which is great. And then one one game that I really enjoyed, that was like me not playing games for like several years, and then I came. Um, so I was like, okay, what is the best game right now? Uh, and uh, I looked it up, and was basically Death Cells one. And so I played Death Cells for like month because it's actually it's not a kind of game that I usually play because I usually play more strategy, but it's such an amazing game it has so many things that are done so well and i was like oh my god indie games have gotten really really good <laughs> okay um if if i do ask you one final question what would be your best advice to beginners who are looking to contribute to uh the open source or let's say sk11 uh framework so one of the things is um Maybe contribute to something you're using and that you're uh, passionate about. Also, uh, think about the reasons why you want to contribute. Um, the community benefits most for people that will stick around. So if you do like a, what's called a drive-by contribution, so you send a PR and then it gets merged and you never come back, that can be useful, but it's usually not as useful uh, than someone that sticks around. Having people that really stick around, even if you're like not that advanced now uh, or don't have that like really super strong machine learning skills. If you stick around, you'll be really useful as, as someone that can review pull requests and that can um, like help the community move forward. Um, also, yeah, pick something you care about. Maybe I would actually say, depending on your skill level, maybe don't pick scikit-learn because scikit-learn is actually quite hard to contribute to. Um, we tag issues as easy issues and simple issues and good first issues. Um, and they might be good, but scikit-learn is moving relatively slowly. And so, I mean, I'm obviously quite passionate about it, but um, if you want, you know, a quick return and you want to have something that moves quickly and where you then maybe um, a smaller project or a newer project might be better. Like the, the way I develop Dabble is like 100% different than the way I develop scikit-learn. And... Um, so, yeah, pick, I guess, pick what you want to contribute to um, some, somewhat carefully. I mean, maybe it doesn't matter so much for the first pull request, but if you want to get involved in the community, um, see what the community is like. Um, if you're frustrated by things being slow, then scikit-learn might not be the best for you because we can be really slow. Um, if you have a lot of patience and you really care about uh, machine learning algorithms, then uh, scikit-learn might be great. The other thing is maybe the biggest mistake that I see people make over and over again is they start with something big. If your first pull request to any project should be something small. And mm -hmm. um, if you're new to open source, maybe it can be something trivial, um, though make sure it's not something that annoys them. So personally, I love pull requests that fix typos in documentation. I other people that's how you also started initially. That's how I started, initially. yes. And... Uh, some projects might think it's annoying. I don't, or fix. I also fix a lot of PEP8. Right now, we don't really want pull requests that just fix, fix PEP8 issues, uh, because they break like um, they break uh, mergeability of other PRs. Maybe you might have conflicts and so on. So the you should find something that's very easy, but you're relatively certain that the people want it. Or it can be like a small feature that you really care. Let's say I always wish they had X, and you add. You ask, do you want X? And if they say yes, then you, you, you give it. But um, try to do it with something small. Don't try to add a new feature because it will take a long time. It might not be in scope. And also, it's quite tricky for the maintainers. If they don't know you and they take a whole bunch of code from you, are you going to come back to maintain the code or not? Um, Basically, there's a great uh, write-up, I think, by Brad Cannon that talks about the box of uh, puppies that says, like, basically, a pull request or a contribution is like a box of puppies, um, saying, like, well, you give it to some of them. It, it might be cute now, but 
in a, on the long term, you really need to have, have to take care of it. And sort of the, the taking care of it is a lot much more work than giving the box of the puppies. And so <laughs> trying to, so if you do something small or if you fix something in existing code, that's much more uh, likely to um, get the trust of the maintainers than adding a giant feature. And that is equally important work if, if I dare say so. Uh, which one? I mean, the, the uh, fixing stuff is like at least as important. It's, and it's much harder to get people to do it. One of the reasons we kind of stopped doing Google Summer of Code with scikit-learn is, um, well, there's two reasons. One, it's very hard to scope projects that are three months long for scikit-learn because most of the work isn't like that because we don't add big things. And the other thing is that even if they add a thing, the our actual bottleneck is reviewing the code not contributions. We have a bunch of big contributions that are not reviewed lying around. So having a junior developer create, or even a senior developer create a huge pile of code is not useful to scikit-learn because there's no one there to review it. And so, um, yeah. The, the question is really, what is the, what is the value add for the project? And if the project says, oh, we really need this huge thing, but we just, no one has time to implement it, but this would be the best, the best thing ever, if someone built this huge thing, then maybe go build a huge thing. Uh, but maybe don't do that as the first thing. Maybe uh, do something small to learn the culture of the project, to uh, learn the process, um, to learn like how their CI is set up, how, what kind of guidelines they use, and so on. So I missed out on one communi community question that I'd like to ask now. Uh, what are your thoughts on Rapids or the shift towards uh, GPU-based uh, frameworks? Uh, also a good question. So I haven't worked much with Rapids. Um, from from what I understand, the uh, quite quite good engineering team uh, over there, um, working really hard. Um, I think it's a little bit. It depends on your goals. Um, so for a lot of the algorithms, you don't get as much of a speed up. So I think. Um, what I heard for gradient boosting is you get like a 3x speed up realistically, maybe a 5x speed up. And um, then you can ask yourself, is it worth um, having extra hardware to get a 3x speed up? And um, I mean, that's just something you have to evaluate for yourself. Like what are the costs and benefit? Like if I'm uh, doing this on the cloud, it, Clearly depends on the cloud prices. Like if yeah. the cloud is subsidized by NVIDIA and they, it's uh, free to get uh, GPUs, then sure, I'll take a free th uh, three times speed up, right? But if, it ta uh, if it's um, more expensive and that's not your bottleneck, then maybe it's not worth it. Um, and it depends a lot on the algorithm and on a data set. Like if your data set doesn't fit on the GPU, for example, like then, but it does fit in RAM, maybe it's, it could be that it's faster to do it in RAM than to do it on GPU. And so it depends on the data set size and it depends on the algorithm, how, how much you gain. And um, then it depends on your particular situation, is that gain worth it? Um, so th this is the, the choice you should make as a user. As developer, we need to make a different choice, which is, do we want to uh, support GPUs? And scikit-learn doesn't support GPUs, basically because we don't want to deal with the pain that uh, of like um, dealing, dealing with CUDA dependencies. Also, it would mean that basically rewriting each algorithm to have a CPU and a GPU version. Mm. And so we're glad that if the Rapids guy do that, that's, uh, I'm that's glad someone is doing it. I think I think it's great to have it. I think it's good to have an option to do this. I don't think it's necessarily the right solution for all the problems. It's also a future-facing uh, direction of movement, if I, if I may. Yeah, but I mean, I don't think the trade-off... I'm not sure how much a trade-off will change. I guess it depends on how the pricing and cloud providers will change. Yep. But I guess the... Pr and that will change the price of the hardware potentially, but that's like, yeah, I don't know. I, I think that's very hard to forecast because there's a strong interaction between 
uh, I guess, how many, uh, like whether uh, Google puts a GPU in all of their, uh, or Amazon puts a GPU in all of their boxes, uh, yeah. it's probably related to whether Nvidia will buy, will build new factories and then will relate to how, how expensive it is. But there's probably a baseline price of building GPUs uh, that you can't get down. And so actually, I, 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 I don't know how, how the pricing on this works, but I think, um, the cost benefit analysis is what makes or breaks it. Yeah. Right. Makes sense. Uh, before we end the call, uh, I'll definitely have all of your profiles linked in the show notes. Uh, what, but what would be the best platforms to connect with you? I know there's a YouTube channel as well. There's your website and your Twitter handle. Anything else that you'd like to mention? Uh, I mean, any cycle unrelated things go to the issue tracker, or if you just have a question, maybe go to the mailing list. Um, you can probably find my email, though I guess generally I don't really like answering questions per email because if everybody sends me a question per email, then I don't do anything else. So um, if you can find a different platform to ask your question, that's uh, uh, that's probably works well. If you if you want to engage about something, that definitely send me an email. Uh, if you have ideas, um, I'm happy to. Like, email is probably the best way to reach me, um, but uh, as the more I can take away from my inbox, the better. <laughs> okay. Uh, and yes, thank you so much uh, on behalf of the community for all of your contributions and advanced congratulations on the move to Microsoft. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. This was, this was a lot of fun. A lot of great questions from the community. Really enjoyed it. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much for listening to this episode. If you enjoyed the show, please be sure to give it a review or feel free to shoot me a message. You can find all of the social media links in the description. If you like the show, please subscribe and tune in each week to Chai Time Data Science.